Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, good day to you. I'm Dr. Gaurav Agnihotri and today I'm going to give a talk on the soft palate. Now imagine a system, imagine a scenario that uh, you are at a traffic crossing and the traffic lights are not working. So what happens? Ultimately, everyone has their own free will and it leads to confusion, chaos and you are not able to cross and the other persons are also not able to cross and there is constant honking of horns and there is all uh, trouble everywhere. So, what was needed at that place was a traffic controller. Similar is the function of soft palate. It acts as a traffic controller at a very crucial junction, the junction of air passage and food passage. So, it selectively allows the passage of air and passage of food according to the needs and so it controls the flow at that particular junction, junction of air passage and food passage. Now this soft palate is also important because of its uh, developmental anomalies. The cleft lip and cleft palate are the most common congenital anomalies in the head and neck and the incidence is 1 per 750 live births. So one can see in the slide here that uh, on the extreme right the cleft is there but it is not to a severe extent so that it is restricted to the uvula. It is a case of bifid uvula. On the extreme left you can see that the cleft has extending into the soft palate. So we call it a soft palate cleft and in the center the extent is much more. Now the cleft has extended into the hard palate. So we have a soft palate cleft here in the central figure extending into the hard palate and on the left side we see the labeling paralysis of soft palate. So soft palate paralysis may also take place. Uh, we were often taught that there is a 10 plus 7 is equal to 12 plus 5. 10 plus 7 is equal to 12 plus 5. Now 10 plus 7 is 17 and 12 plus 5 is also 17. So our teachers used to tell us that see 10 plus 7 means 10th nerve and 7th nerve. So in case of paralysis of 10th cranial nerve or 7th cranial nerve, the effects will be such that there will be deviation towards the normal side. For example, in 7th nerve lesion, when a person smiles, the angle of mouth is deviated towards the normal side. And for the tenth nerve damage, when the person opens the mouth, as you see in the figure, there the soft palate will be deviated towards the normal side. So for tenth nerve lesion and seventh nerve lesion, the deviations will be towards the normal side. 10 plus 7 is equal to 12 plus 5. So for the twelfth nerve lesion, when the person protrudes the tongue, the deviation will be towards the side of paralysis. And for the fifth nerve, when the person opens the mouth, the angle will deviate, the jaw will deviate towards the paralyzed side. So here in this particular figure, we are, can visualize that the soft palate is deviating towards the normal side due to the tenth nerve lesion. Now this soft palate has got a vital role to play. It is a muscular ridge and its function is to control traffic. And provide a normal physiological phenomena. So soft palate is a movable muscular fold suspended from posterior border of hard palate. It separates the nasopharynx from the oropharynx. A traffic controller at crossroads between air and food passages. So we can see in the figure the hard palate in front and at the posterior border of the hard palate the soft palate is there. It is like 
the curve is like my hand and uh, this curve of the soft palate it uh, you can see a part is going backwards and a part is going downwards. So, we will come to this uh, morphological profile of the soft palate. Soft palate has got two surfaces, anterior surface is concave, posterior surface is convex and it, it has two borders. The superior border is attached to posterior border of hard palate, blending of each on each side with the pharynx. So, superior border is attached to posterior border of hard palate, while inferior border is free. In its middle, there hangs a conical projection called the uvula. So, you can see in the figure here the conical projection which is marked that is the uvula. And on the sides you can make out the tonsil and in the front you can make out the tongue. So, when the person opens the mouth, one can see the uvula hanging down, lower border of the soft palate can be seen, the upper border of the soft palate is getting attached to the posterior border of the hard palate. So, this is the morphological profile of the soft palate. Now, from each side of the base of uvula, so uvula has got a projection in the center. Now, from each side of the base, there are two folds of mucous membrane like my two fingers. One fold is going anteriorly, other fold is going posteriorly. This anterior fold represents the palatoglossal arch, while the posterior fold represents the palatopharyngeal arch. So, you can see in the section here, you can make out the soft palate above and below it two green lines are there. One is the palatoglossal arch and uh, two is the palatopharyngeal arch and in between the two arches is lying the tonsillar fossa. This tonsillar fossa contains the almond shaped tonsil. So, I read from the slide, from each side of base of uvula, two curved folds of mucous membrane extend laterally and downwards. The anterior fold is called palatoglossal arch. It contains the palatoglossal muscle and reaches side of tongue at junction of oral and pharyngeal parts. Fold forms lateral boundary of oropharyngeal isthmus. Posterior fold is called palatopharyngeal arch. It contains the palatopharyngeus muscle, forms posterior boundary of tonsillar fossa and merges inferiorly with lateral wall of pharynx. Now, this particular diagram is very important to understand. The fibrous basis of the soft palate is formed by the palatine aponeurosis. The palatine aponeurosis is formed by a muscle which is called tensor veli palati marked by F in the figure. So, you can see that F is tensor veli palati and it is forming the fibrous basis of the soft palate that is B. B is the palatine aponeurosis. Now, on this B, on the superior surface, this palatine of palatine aponeurosis, there is a muscle which is coming that is E. So, there is a muscle lying on the superior surface of palatine aponeurosis E. This muscle is called the levator veli palatine and another muscle on the superior surface of palatine aponeurosis is D. This muscle is the palatopharyngeus and on the inferior aspect of the palatine aponeurosis is the muscle C. This muscle is the palatoglossus. So, once again I repeat that this muscle F is the tensor veli palatine muscle. Its aponeurosis is called palatine aponeurosis marked by B in the figure. Now, this palatine aponeurosis is splitting in the center to enclose the musculus uvula muscle marked by A in the figure. Now, on the upper surface of this palatine aponeurosis, you see the muscle E attached on each side. This muscle E is the levator veli palati and you also see the muscle D attached on the upper surface of palatine aponeurosis. This muscle is the palatopharyngeus muscle and a muscle lies in relation to the inferior aspect of palatine aponeurosis that muscle is C, that muscle is the palatoglossus muscle. So, this diagram is very important to understand. G represents the pterygoid humulus. So, this diagram if one understands, one can understand the morphology of the soft palate, the action of the muscles of the soft palate and the formation of the soft palate. There should be no problem if one understands this particular diagram. So, this diagram I refer to as the key diagram to understand the soft palate. So, the muscles of the soft palate, can we name them please? They are tensor veli palati, levator veli palati, musculus uvulae, palatoglossus and the palatopharyngeus muscle. So, once again 
I repeat because this is very important that the tensor veli palati forms the palatine aponeurosis, F forms B and it splits in the center to enclose A which is the muscular u musculus uvulae. There are two muscles lying on the upper aspect of palatine aponeurosis, levator veli palati marked by E and palatopharyngeus marked by D and there is one muscle on each side in relation to the lower surface of the palatine aponeurosis that is the palatoglossus muscle marked by C. So if we understand these diagrams, we can understand the location of the muscles as well as the action of the muscles of the soft palate. Now we come to the first muscle that is the tensor veli palati. Now this tensor veli palati is the muscle which is arising from the lateral side of the auditory tube. You can make out in the figure there is a muscle uh, which is arising from the lateral side of the auditory tube. Now as I read from the slide, uh, tensor veli palati, triangular muscle, its origin is lateral side of auditory tube. Another origin is adjoining part of base of skull. Insertion is the muscle descends to form a delicate tendon which winds down the pterygoid humulus and flattens out to form the palatine aponeurosis. So this muscle tensor veli palati forms the palatine aponeurosis which is attached to posterior border of the hard palate. So this palatine aponeurosis is attached to posterior border of the hard palate. So one in the figure is the auditory tube and below it anteriorly is lying the tensor veli palati muscle which forms the palatine aponeurosis and it is getting inserted to the posterior border of the hard palate mainly and also the inferior surface of palate behind the palatine crest. Now if you look at its origin and insertion tensor veli palati where it is arising from? It is arising from the lateral side of auditory tube. So when this muscle is contracting what will be the effect of the muscle? The effect of the muscle will be to open the auditory tube. And as the name of the muscle indicates, it is tensor veli palati. It tenses the soft palate. So therein, there we have it. We have the two actions of the tensor veli palati muscle. Now why is opening of the auditory tube important? Opening of the auditory tube is important because opening of the auditory tube facilitates equalizing the air pressure in the middle ear cavity on one side and the nasopharynx on the other side. So for example, when I have come for these lectures, I have come by a plane. So when the plane was ascending, I experienced some pain in my ear that my tympanic membrane was bulging out. So what was needed then to relieve that pain that the auditory tube should open like a vent and it should remove air from the middle ear cavity into the nasopharynx. Similarly, when the plane was descending at the same time, Again I felt at that particular time the same pain. That pain was due to the tympanic membrane retracting inwards. And due to the retraction of the tympanic membrane, what was needed? Auditory tube was needed to open so that air enters the middle ear cavity. So this auditory tube is like a vent and its function opening and closing is controlled by the tensor veli palati. It is also controlled by the levator veli palati. We will come to that later on. So tensor veli palati is an important muscle. It tenses the soft palate. It opens the auditory tube to equalize air pressure between middle ear and nasopharynx. Now levator veli palati. Levator veli palati as the name indicates it is an elevator. Levator, elevator. Levator veli palati is a cylindrical muscle which lies deep to tensor veli palati. So in the figure, one is the auditory tube, anteriorly is lying the tensor veli palati and behind that is the levator veli palati. So it is origin is from inferior aspect of auditory tube lying behind the tensor veli palati. So this levator veli palati, it is also attached to auditory tube. So it also controls the auditory tube. And other origin is from adjoining part of inferior surface of petrous temporal bone. Insertion is that this muscle runs downwards and medially and is inserted into the upper part of the palatine aponeurosis. In the figure below you can make out F is the tensor veli palati, it forms B that is the palatine aponeurosis and the levator veli palati that is E is getting attached onto the upper surface of the 
palatine aponeurosis. Now, the function of this muscle is one is to regulate the opening of the auditory tube because like the tensor veli palatii, it is attached to the auditory tube. Secondly, it's an elevator of the soft palate. And what happens if the fold is like this? What happens if the fold is elevated? Then this passage is closed. This passage is the, this is the nose here, this is the nasopharynx here. So it closes the nasopharyngeal isthmus. So this muscle, levator veli palatii, it closes the nasopharyngeal isthmus along with the palatopharyngeus muscle. We'll see that later on how that happens. So actions of levator veli palatii, once again, I reinforce, it elevates the soft palate and closes the pharyngeal isthmus. It opens the auditory tube like tensor veli palatii muscle. Now we come to the musculus uvulae. Musculus uvulae, uh, one can appreciate in the figure, it arises from the posterior nasal spine and palatine aponeurosis. Insertion is into the mucous membrane of the uvula. So this muscle is the musculus uvulae muscle. Musculus uvulae muscle uh, is a muscle which is going from the posterior nasal spine to the mucous membrane of the uvula. It pulls up the uvula. In the figure below also you can see longitudinal strips to the, the tensor veli palatii, the palatine aponeurosis splits to enclose the musculus uvulae muscle and its function is to pull up the uvula. Then we come to the palatoglossus muscle, which is marked by three in the figure. It arises from the oral surface of palatine aponeurosis and insertion is, it descends in the palatoglossal arch to side of tongue at junction of its oral and pharyngeal parts. So it goes to the junction of oral and pharyngeal parts of the tongue. So what this muscle will do is that since this muscle is forming the anterior boundary of the tonsillar fossa, when this muscle contracts on each side, it shortens, it will close the oropharyngeal isthmus. It closes the oropharyngeal isthmus. So nasopharyngeal isthmus is closed by levator veli palatii while the oropharyngeal isthmus is closed by the uh, palatoglossus muscle. So we come to the next slide. Palatopharyngeus muscle, it has got two fasciculi separated by levator veli palatii. The anterior fasciculus is attached to the posterior border of hard palate. So this muscle which we see here marked by four is the palatopharyngeus muscle, posterior border of hard palate anterior fasciculus, posterior fasciculus from the palatine aponeurosis. This muscle goes down to form the longitudinal muscle coat of the pharynx. And five here is the musculus uvulae, four here is the uh, representing the palatopharyngeus muscle. Now, the palatopharyngeus muscle is inserted into the posterior border of lamina of thyroid cartilage, wall of pharynx and its median plane. Now what is the function of this palatopharyngeus muscle? It will pull up the pharynx because it goes down to form the longitudinal muscle coat of the pharynx. So when this muscle contracts, it pulls up the pharynx and this action is required in swallowing, during swallowing. So palatopharyngeus does that and it also forms a part of this muscle developmentally is left behind in the nasopharynx and this muscle is also responsible for closing the nasopharyngeal isthmus along with the levator veli palatii. Let us see how. For that, we must understand the concept of the Passavant's ridge. Now, what is the Passavant's ridge? In some mammals, the epiglottis, which is a part of the larynx, it lies at a higher level. So, in human beings, what has happened is that the larynx has descended down with time. So, due to the descent of the larynx, some part of the laryngeal musculature that is some part of the palatopharyngeus is left behind in the nasopharynx. That part is marked by C in the figure and it forms a sphincter in the posterior wall of nasopharynx. So this C-shaped sphincter formed in the posterior wall of nasopharynx is the Passavant's ridge. So this is nothing but a part of the palatopharyngeus muscle which has been left behind due to evolutionary changes in human beings. Now what happens is when the levator veli palatii contracts, it meets with this sphincter posteriorly and then the nasopharyngeal isthmus is completely closed. 
So nasopharyngeal isthmus is closed by the action of levator veli palati as well as the contraction of the C-shaped passavant's ridge. So passavant's ridge is lying on the posterior wall of nasopharynx and the levator veli palati gets elevated, it joins the passavant's ridge and together these two muscles cause the closure of the nasopharyngeal isthmus. So it keeps the respiratory pathway separate from the uh, food pathway. So mammals with an acute sense of sen smell have epiglottis above level of soft palate supported by sphincter formed by palatopharyngeus. In humans, larynx descends and pulls sphincter downwards leading to formation of the palatopharyngeus muscle. Now this is important. However, some fibers of the sphincter are left behind to form a sphincter inner to superior constrictor. These fibers constitute the passavant's muscle. So it is nothing, passavant's muscle is nothing but a ridge in the posterior wall of the nasopharynx and this ridge is an extension of the palatopharyngeus muscle. And the palatopharyngeus muscle is best developed in cases of cleft palate as this compensates to some extent for the deficiency in the palate. So in cases of cleft palate, they have found that this muscle compensatory, compensatorily develops more compared to the other cases. So this muscle is of uh, very much interest to anatomists and uh, uh, persons studying evolution because this has got an evolutionary significance. Now we come to the nerve supply of the soft palate. The nerve supply of the soft palate, well, there is a pharyngeal plexus. This pharyngeal plexus is lying on the middle constrictor of the pharynx. First let us see how this pharyngeal plexus is formed. So this is showing you the formation of the pharyngeal plexus. Pharyngeal plexus is formed from three components. Now what are the three components? Pharyngeal branch of ninth nerve, pharyngeal branch of vagus carrying fibers of cranial accessory nerve and the pharyngeal branches of superior cervical sympathetic ganglion. So this pharyngeal plexus is formed from three components, pharyngeal branch of ninth nerve, pharyngeal branch of 10th nerve carrying fibers of 11th nerve and the pharyngeal branches of superior cervical sympathetic ganglion. Now all muscles, all muscles of soft palate are supplied by the pharyngeal plexus except the tensor veli palati which is supplied by the mandibular nerve. If you remember when we did the muscles of mastication at that time it was reinforced and taught to all the students that all muscles of mastication are supplied by anterior branch of mandibular nerve except the medial pterygoid which is supplied by the main trunk. Therein, Another line was there, the nerve to medial pterygoid also supplies the tensor veli palati and the tensor tympani. Tensor tympani is a muscle of the ear while tensor veli palati is the muscle of the soft palate. So this completes the nerve supply of the muscles of the soft palate and this is a very frequently asked question in the examinations. What is the nerve supply of the muscles of the soft palate and the answer is pharyngeal plexus. Then the next question logically is where is the pharyngeal plexus formed and how is it formed? So there you must remember that there are three components leading to the formation of the pharyngeal plexus and this pharyngeal plexus lies on the middle constrictor of the pharynx. Now general sensory nerves are derived from middle and posterior lesser palatine nerves which are branches of maxillary nerve through the pterygopalatine ganglion and also the glossopharyngeal nerve. The special sensory and gastratory nerves carrying taste sensations from oral surface are contained in lesser palatine nerves. Fibers travel through greater petrosal nerve to geniculate ganglion of facial nerve and from there to nucleus of solitary tract. Secretomotor fibers are also contained in the lesser palatine nerves. They are derived from superior salivatory nucleus and travel through the greater petrosal nerve. So this completes the nerve supply of the soft palate. Now the movements and functions of the soft palate. Soft palate controls the two gates. Now what are the two gates? One is the nasopharyngeal isthmus lying between nasopharynx and mouth and other is the oropharyngeal isthmus. So there are two openings. One opening in front, whatever food we eat is going to pass through the oropharyngeal isthmus whatever air we breathe is going to go through the nasopharyngeal isthmus. 
So these two openings are regulated effectively by the soft palate. How it does that? I'll repeat once again that there is a palatoglossus muscle, palatoglossus muscle lying in the palatoglossal arch. Now you can see a tonsil here in the slide. Tonsil is lying in between the palatoglossal arch and the palatopharyngeal arch. So it is lying in the lateral wall. So when the palatoglossal muscles of the two sides, they approximate, the oropharyngeal isthmus is closed. So this is important for breathing. When the oropharyngeal isthmus is closed, then air can easily go from nasopharynx, passing through oropharynx, it can go to the trachea. And when the food is being eaten, at that time it is very important that no nasal regurgitation to, should take place. So that is mediated by the action of, that is uh, done by the action of the levator veli palati, which will pull the palate upwards and at the same time there is a sphincter posterior to it. So the levator veli palati will pull the palate upwards and the sphincter at the back, the passavant's ridge will also contract and this will separate the nasopharynx from the oropharynx and the food which we eat will pass through the oropharyngeal isthmus into the pharynx. It will not go up, it will not regurgitate up into the nasopharynx. So this is how the soft palate is uh, controlling the physiology. Whenever we sneeze, whenever we sneeze, then that flow of air is divided equally between the nasopharynx and the mouth in such a manner so that not too much pressure is exerted either on the nasopharynx to damage it or to the mouth and its mucosa. And at the same time when we cough, the soft palate ensures that the sputum passes into the mouth and does not regurgitate into the nasopharynx. If the soft palate is not functioning properly, the person will have a nasal twang in the voice. So our voice control, the resonance of our voice control, the quality of the voice, the quality of my voice is also being controlled by this wonderful muscle, uh, plethora of muscles forming the soft palate. So I read, by varying the degree of closure of pharyngeal isthmus, quality of voice can be modified and various consonants then are correctly pronounced. During sneezing, blast of air is appropriately divided and directed through the nasal and oral cavities without damaging the narrow nose. Similarly, during coughing, it directs, soft palate directs air and sputum into the mouth and not into the nose. Now we come to the blood supply and lymphatics vis-a-vis -vis the soft palate. So greater palatine branch of maxillary artery, ascending palatine branch of facial artery and the palatine branch of ascending pharyngeal artery. So wherever you find the palatine branch, that palatine branch is going to supply the soft palate. As far as the veins are concerned, the veins pass to the pterygoid and tonsillar plexus of veins. Lymphatics, well the lymphatics drain into the upper deep cervical and retropharyngeal lymph nodes. So soft palate has got a good blood supply and is richly supplied by the lymphatics. Now development of the soft palate, this is also very important because as I told you earlier, one in every 750 live births, the cleft lip, cleft palate is there. So what is the developmental basis of this? See there is a frontonasal process. This frontonasal process will form the philtrum of the upper lip. The central part of the upper lip is called the philtrum. So this philtrum, the nasal septum of the nose as well as the premaxilla. Premaxilla is the part of the hard palate which is the anterior part which is bearing the four incisor teeth. So the premaxilla and the nasal septum and the philtrum, they are formed from the front frontonasal process. While the maxillary process is going to form the rest of the hard palate. So if you look in the figure, the area 2 that is the premaxilla that is formed from the frontonasal process while area 3 and 4 they are formed by the maxillary process. So in case there is no proper fusion or you can say there is Im improper fusion between 2 and 3 and 4 that will give rise to cleft palate and the degree will vary and this can be unilateral or it can be bilateral. So I read from the slide, 
During development of phase, five processes develop around the primitive mouth. The primitive mouth is called stomatodium. Frontonasal process projects down from the cranium. Two maxillary processes on each side. Two mandibular processes on each side. So frontonasal process is coming from above. Two maxillary processes and two mand mandibular processes are there. The frontonasal process forms the philtrum of the upper lip, which is the central part of the upper lip. This hole is the upper lip, even this is a part of the upper lip. So central part of the upper lip is formed by the frontonasal process. Frontonasal process forms the philtrum of upper lip and it also forms the primary palate. Primary palate is marked by two in the figure. The primary palate is also called premaxilla. By definition, it is the V-shaped anterior portion of upper jaw which bears the four incisor teeth. So fusion of premaxilla, if it takes place properly with the maxillary components, that is if two and three, they fuse properly, then there will be no cleft. But if the fusion is improper, it will lead to cleft formation. Maxillary process forms whole of upper lip except philtrum. So except the central part which is formed by frontonasal process, the whole of the upper lip is formed by maxilla. And it forms whole of the palate except premaxilla. So three and four are formed by the maxillary process. This part of palate is called secondary palate. This in fact is formed by midline fusion of two palatine processes which develop from inner aspects of maxillary processes. So the summary is that the palate is formed by fusion of secondary palate with the primary palate. Primary palate is frontonasal in, or in origin while secondary palate is derived from the maxillary processes. So incomplete fusion may be there unilaterally or it may be bilaterally and the degree also varies. So complete cleft may be unilateral as seen on the left side, it may be bilateral as seen in the other figure, it's there on both the sides on the right side and if you see the figures below, the partial cleft palate is there, uh, it may manifest as bifid uvula on the extreme left or it may be a cleft of soft palate in the center or it may be a big cleft which is extending into the hard palate. So these developmental anomalies and the developmental basis of the cleft palate that has to be understood. Uh, this is also required for effective treatment management and understanding the degree of the uh, cleft which is existing. What is the reason for the degree of the cleft? Why it is lesser degree or it is a higher degree? We can make out and understand only if we know the development of the hard palate. Now paralysis of soft palate in lesions of vagus nerve. So I mentioned before 10 plus 7 is equal to 12 plus 5. So here the uvula is directed towards the normal side. So if the paralysis of soft palate is there, I mentioned in the motor nerve supply that uh, uh, the motor nerve supply is by the pharyngeal branches of the vagus carrying fibers of the cranial accessory nerve. So if there is a damage to the motor supply, there is nasal regurgitation of liquids, nasal twang, twang in voice and flattening of the palatal arch. So we have to understand that this soft palate is a traffic controller at a very important junction and its uh, normal working is required to perform many physiological processes and uh, it is very vital for our normal existence and uh, without it there are so many abnormalities and imperfections and if they are there, if there are developmental abnormalities, then to treat them, we must understand the whole of the developmental process related to the soft palate and the action of its muscles. So uh, this concludes my talk on the soft palate. Uh, till the next time, see you again, bye, regards and namaste.